hi, and welcome to all of you from all of us, the executive committee of the Rutgers United Nations Alumni Interest Group. We are delighted you are joining us for this special event from the Rutgers classroom to the United Nations, building a successful career in global affairs. We have an exciting panel of Rutgers alums who are working in the field of global affairs, and we're sure you will gain from hearing about their remarkable career paths and their important work in the field. Before we begin, we, the executive committee, wanted to quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Mary Ella Hannum. I am the founder and president of the Rutgers United Nations Alumni Interest Group, and I am a graduate of Douglas College and Rutgers Graduate School in Newark, Division of Global Affairs. Anne? Hi, everyone. I'm Anne. I'm a graduate of Douglas College. And I know that you're here to see our fabulous panelists, not me. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton. Um, I'm not sure if we have John on yet. Um, if not, I'll pass it to Arif. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Arif Rana. I'm actually the, I serve as a secretary for the Rutgers United Nations Alumni Interest Group. Uh, I am a graduate of Rutgers College, uh, the School of Health Related Professions, as well as the uh, Graduate School of Education in New Brunswick. So the easiest way to join the Rutgers United Nations Alumni Interest Group is to go to LinkedIn, search for the name of the group and request an invite to join or you can also find our email address, LinkedIn page and mission statement on the group's webpage via the RUAA website, which is the Rutgers University Alumni Association. We will be holding an open general meeting as well as an additional program event similar to this one in the spring semester. Now to start tonight's event, I have the very special privilege of introducing Dr. Gary Farney, who will welcome you all to the event and kick things off. Dr. Farney is a Roman historian and archeologist with a strong interest in global education. At Rutgers, he's led three successful study abroad summer programs since 2005 in Greece, Italy, and Malta, including a longstanding archeological field school in Italy since 2012. Professor Farney also co-founded the Mediterranean Displacements Project, which is an interdisciplinary faculty working group devoted to the study of migration, displacement, refugees, and climate change in the Mediterranean. I'm very pleased and grateful that Dr. Farney could join us here today. Professor Farney. Thanks a lot, Mariella. Thanks for the kind words. And uh, yeah, I'd like to Welcome everyone here. This is a great event. I'd like to thank Mariella and the UN Alumni Group and uh, Rutgers Foundations and Alumni Association, you know, for this opportunity. It's it's a great opportunity for DGA students and other students to who are you know thinking about a career in global affairs to hear from people who are actually in the field, not just from academics, from people who have are kind of become what they would like to be one day in, in some respects, to be able to be a professional in the field of global affairs. Um, I'd like to introduce now our uh, moderator for this evening, uh, who is Margot Baruch. Um, she's currently a PhD student in the Division of Global Affairs at Rutgers, and she has quite a resume already. Uh, most recently, she served as a director of leadership and at, in as well as being an adjunct professor at Douglas Residential College. Her past experience also includes work with the Center for Women's Global Leadership, managing the economic and social rights portfolio and advocating for women's rights at the UN using international human rights mechanisms. Since 2016, she has served on the board of the YWCA Union County, focusing on eliminating racism and empowering women, and in 2019 was appointed to the YWCA U.S. Global Relations Committee. So please join me in welcoming Margot, who's going to uh, moderate today and introduce all our speakers. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Farney, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Mariella and the Rutgers Alumni Association for organizing this special event. Uh, before we get started, I've been asked to conduct three polls. 
They'll appear on your screen for about 20 seconds each. And um, Stephanie should be adding those now. Um, so please re respond quickly. The first one is about your direct affiliation. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Uh, the second one is related to your interest in the Rutgers UN alumni group. I think we missed one. This is the third one about the um, issue, your issues and interest in global, global themes and areas. Let's see. Did we already do the one about um, the interest in the Rutgers UN alumni group? Okay, yep. yeah, can you do the other one too now? Great, excellent. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. So the speakers you'll hear from this evening work at the United Nations and are all graduates of Rutgers University. They, like many of you, have walked into a Rutgers classroom, had to complete those challenging Rutgers exams, and have faced the ups and downs of finding their way. The stories they'll share with you tonight will offer unique wisdom, realistic advice, and reflections about their professions. We hope that their presentations will offer you valuable insight into your future career. Each speaker will have about 10 minutes and following their presentation, we'll open the discussion for questions and we'll be able to get to as many as our time permits. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. First, we'll hear from Pablo Castillo Diaz, then Daniel Mallon, and finally, Yurina Shura. Thank you everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Welcome, Pablo. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I am a graduate of the Division of Global Affairs and work currently at UN Women in headquarters. I'd like to start with a scary number. Uh, the global workforce of the UN is more than 100,000 people or so, but um, uh, we have about 37,000 working in the UN Secretariat, both in the field and headquarters. Uh, out of those 37,000, only 1.7% are under 30 years old, 1.7%. Uh, obviously the UN has internships and, and junior professional officers and young leaders and um, all these other uh, you know, programs, but they don't make up for the fact that the UN is not particularly good at hiring, uh, at recruiting young uh, people. So, but, so the, but the UN is part of a much larger ecosystem of uh, regional organizations and think tanks and civil society organizations and government agencies that work on the same things as the UN does and that provide a much broader uh, 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 array of career opportunities. So take elections, for example. Last year, the UN supported the conduct of 22 elections in, uh, uh, you know, throughout the world and uh, helped build the capacity of electoral systems in about 60. But the UN actually doesn't do the, the famous sort of elections observation, the you know, deploying thousands of election monitors through uh, you know, to, to judge whether the results are fair and credible, whether there have been incidents. And these people are often young. This is often a, a good opportunity for young people to get a, a, a good opportunity. And these are deployed not by the UN, but by, the, by regional organizations like the European Union, the African Union, the Organization of American States, the OSCE, even the Carter Center, Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, organization. So again, think beyond the UN uh, or take humanitarian aid, for example. Sadly, 
the demand for humanitarian aid keeps increasing. Uh, conflict's getting worse. The climate crisis is already with, with us, uh, wrecking havoc. And uh, you know, just to give you an idea, uh, in 2014, there were 104 million people in the world that needed humanitarian aid. The number has more than quadrupled in just six or seven years. So this is a field that has an enormous demand uh, for, for people. Uh, uh, you know, there are thousands of humanitarian organizations, dozens of large international organizations. Some of them are as large or larger than many UN agencies. Uh, if, if you go to reliefweb.org, for example, in fact, I went uh, 10 minutes uh, before um, this webinar, you will find more than 3,000 open jobs uh, 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 at the moment. So some of the largest UN agencies, like the UN Development Program or UNICEF or the High Commissioner for Refugees or the World Food Program, higher, you know, they have about 20,000 people. Well, the Red Cross has half a million and then 11 million volunteers. Uh, some of the uh, humanitarian NGOs like Care International and Oxfam and the International Rescue Committee, they, ha they, they have about 10,000 staff workforce throughout the world. So as we're thinking of the UN, I guess my first message is don't think of the UN or don't think of the UN only, uh, but think of the variety of actors that, that care about the things you care about and that do the things that you want to do in the world. But maybe you don't want to cast a white net. You know, you, you have much narrower parameters because of family uh, obligations. You can't uh, live anywhere in the world or, uh, you know, you have a very specific idea of what you want to do. You know where your knowledge or your skills would would uh, have the most uh, uh, impact. Uh, so you invest, you focus, and you invest in a particular organization. So you go to those events uh, uh, and you meet those people. Well, for that, I would say I speak with many people uh, 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 every year that are interested in the UN and they, they, they want to know more about the UN. And the two things that they, they spend their, most of their time on is one, telling me how interested they are in the United Nations. and asking me, what do I do? Or what does my organization do? Or what does my team do? Now, everybody's different, obviously. But uh, in my opinion, don't do either of those things. Or don't spend most of your time doing either of those things. If you want to gain an, an edge or an advantage, um, you should already know what my organization does uh, uh, very well. Uh, and that doesn't mean you know spending 30 minutes on a public website. Uh, the, you know. Website pages are built for the general public. They have basic introductory information. Instead, uh, follow the money. Look for how that organization reports to their donors on how they're spending every dollar. Every dollar. So normally, you'll find the best information sometimes helpfully compiled in annual reports and in more details for uh, their executive boards. So, say for example that you really want to, you've never worked in a peacekeeping organization. And uh, you really want to, you have a hard time imagining what the work is, uh, the, what the work is like. I get the best uh, information for that uh, in the in the reports that they um, produce for the budget committee. Uh, so I go to the ACABQ, which is a real thing and not an acronym I just made up. Uh, and it's an advisory committee, and it's all hidden behind numbers and acronyms. But you find hundred-page long reports there that explain with extreme detail what a peacekeeping mission actually does. And not just the blue helmets, but the civilian advisors that work on human rights or on security sector reform or on disarmament or uh, uh, whatever that may be. Similarly, uh, the UN has more than 100 uh, pooled funds, uh, basically like for COVID recovery or for um, the Spotlight Initiative, for example, which is the most ambitious uh, joint effort to address violence against women in history with hundreds of millions of euros invested by the European Union in collaboration with the United Nations. All of these funds, which have multiple donors, uh, uh, all of their information is housed in the office of the, the multi-partner trust fund office. Uh, and this portal uh, has information about each project, uh, each, each proposal. So uh, this is information that is often hard to get by, but this is actually a big open window into, into what the um, uh, into what work really is like. And when you do this kind of in-depth uh, preparation and investigation, then a light bulb pops up and, you know, you get a better sense of what you could do uh, uh, to fit into this organization or what you already have that would be of value for this organization or what you could develop uh, uh, for it. So 
And then the, the third thing is more about, I guess, uh, mindset or outlook or, or, or perspective in a way, because for a career in global affairs, you can't really uh, fall into cynicism or, or despair. You know, you can't really afford um, either. So obviously there are many things that UN can do and there, you know, we don't have a world government, but you know, in a, in a very difficult year, like last year, they did reach 260 million people with humanitarian aid. They distributed 1.6 billion items of PPE, including to New Yorkers uh, at a moment when uh, they were really scrambling and in need. Uh, billions of meals, they prevented 14 million unintended pregnancies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they, uh, every year, they keep the peace more or less uh, and protect people uh, through 90,000 blue helmets or peacekeepers at a very heavy discount compared to other kinds of uh, military deployments. And sometimes when I follow the news day to day, you know, it looks like the world is uh, sort of spinning out of control, but it helps to step back and, uh, and uh, you know, look at a longer time span. The first time I set foot at the UN as an intern for the UN Development Fund for, for Women is 2005. So I often think of that type, time span. And in that time span, I've seen huge progress on female genital mutilation, maternal mortality, uh, girls' enrollment in secondary education, uh, women's representation in politics, um, and child marriage. Uh, all of them still terrible, uh, uh, still far from where we want to be, uh, but all moving in the right direction. So uh, I'll give you one example of, of, of work that my team does so that you see that process. Um, about 10 years ago, we used to say all the time that sexual violence in conflict was you know, one of history's greatest silences and the least punished uh, war crime. Um, and we started deploying in investigators into uh, international commissions of inquiry and to support investigations of the International Criminal Court. And uh, over the past of over the course of the decade, we've deployed over 150 uh, of these uh, investigators. Uh, and we've gone from total, almost total silence to these crimes being thoroughly and systematically documented, uh, no longer being shrouded in silence, being put in the historical record and sometimes not often, but sometimes uh, uh, that leading to, to justice for, for survivors. Our job's not done, not nearly done. Uh, uh, it, the, these atrocities still happen often and often met with impunity. But even though we, we pine for, for radical transformation and, and, and for change, sometimes all we can hope for is to move the needle just enough so that the next step forward takes us closer, closer to where we wanna be. Uh, that's that's all for, for me, Marla. Thank you so much, Pablo. That was really quite insightful and I really appreciate your your remarks. Um, I think we can really take a lot from that. Um, thinking beyond the UN, you mentioned, you know, humanitarian relief organizations as being a really great um, resource beyond the United Nations. Um, you suggested following the money. Um, and also, I think um, a really great piece of advice is to check your mindset and outlook um, and, and kind of have to lower your levels of cynicism. So thank you, Pablo, for sharing your comments. Um, next up, um, Daniel Mallon will be speaking. Thank you, Daniel. All right, thank you very much, Margo. Um, and thank you very much to uh, the organizers tonight, the Division of Global Affairs at Rutgers, as well as the Rutgers Alumni Association. Thank you for inviting me um, to this event. I do enjoy um, to, uh, speaking with current students um, and to, uh, to, 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 to share some of uh, my experiences on the pathway uh, from, from Rutgers to, to where I am today. Um, I was a Rutgers undergrad student, Rutgers College, um, and um, I think at the time, studying at Rutgers, I didn't really even know at the time what a, an, an international career was. I didn't even really know about the political science major or, or something called international relations. Um, 
I did study economics and French. I've always had an interest in, uh, in international cultures and languages. Um, and I think uh, one of the best things I did was the, the study abroad program uh, in France uh, through Rutgers, um, which was a, a wonderful um, eye opener. Um, I think, uh, you know, finishing, finishing Rutgers uh, in the late 90s, um, for me, you know, this is, this is just uh, to look briefly at, at the pathway of how, I, of how um, things have transpired over, over time. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I began professional life in the private sector financial world. But, you know, a key thing that, that uh, students, current students should, should keep in mind is that you begin one job, not just one employer, but one career path, and you can certainly um, you can certainly switch or realize that that um, there's a different direction you want to go you want to go in. Um, I did have the opportunity then to, uh, to have a short term um, gig, if you will, at the UN, um, as fate would have it, uh, and this really uh, really interested me. Uh, it got me very interested in, in African affairs specifically. I think my initial interest in African affairs, which is where I work now, I'll, I'll come to that. But uh, that probably began at Rutgers as well as part of my French major in uh, one of the African West African literature classes I took. I think uh, uh, that really was, a, was an initial eye opener for me. And um, uh, I, I decided, you know, after working for a bit after Rutgers that, um, for me, I, I wanted to, to study um, international affairs, international relations at the graduate level. It was, it was something where, again, I finished uh, undergrad with an economics major, but uh, diverted and, and decided this is the, the, the career path for me. I did work for a, um, an African-based NGO in New York for a couple of years um, to gain additional experience. I would definitely recommend that uh, if, uh, you're looking for a career in, let's say, the United Nations. Uh, as Pablo mentioned, there's not just the UN. There's many wonderful organizations, um, some very big, some smaller, uh, that do do amazing work. In fact, do more agile work in many cases on the ground uh, in, in humanitarian response. Um, so always, you should keep your mind open. I think this is a, a key. Um, after doing a um, a two year uh, master's degree in international affairs. Uh, I also I, I had my 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 own eyes set on a United Nations career, and again, it's not it's not the easiest. And I, and Pablo, that was an amazing statistic. One point seven percent of of UN Secretariat staff under thirty. I, I believe that <laughs> uh, you certainly don't see enough young um, young people as staff in in the UN or the UN system. I think globally. Um, but um, again, this is for me. This is where um, you know the route. The route to where you want to go is not always straightforward, and of course, it depends on your personal circumstances and what you were able to do. But even uh, having just gotten married in New York after graduate school, um, my new wife and I were willing and open to the adventure of, of moving to Vienna, Austria. Um, not initially for a UN job, but a different uh, type of job in the international relations sphere um, with, the, with my hope that it might lead to something more. Um, and it did, uh, after a year or so, I was able to, to get a position uh, initially short-term with the International Atomic Energy Agency. I'm not a nuclear person, I know nothing about safeguards, but uh, in the global health sphere in, um, in cancer control, looking at a, as a global public health issue with radiation therapy as a, as a background. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this, this also has to do with the modalities of, of different contract types in the UN system. Um, coming in with a full staff contract would be ideal. It's not always uh, feasible and not always uh, uh, really the easiest way to do it. Uh, for me, it was coming in initially with a consultant contract and then a short-term staff contract that was not guaranteed after a year. And so I think looking at, 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 at possibilities, you know, if you're open to being able to, 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 to take these type of opportunities that are not initially you know, full staff contract uh, within the UN system, that, that's, uh, that's one way, that's a certainly a good way to come into the UN system. Um, 
after some time, uh, my family moved to, uh, we moved to Johannesburg, uh, where I had a position with a different UN agency. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, full circle, I mean, I'm a New Jersey guy, I grew up in, in New Jersey, but after 11 years and, and three children later, we moved back to the US uh, about five years ago. Um, and uh, I, I have a position in the UN Secretariat uh, working on African affairs in a, in a small unit of the uh, Secretariat, the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa, <clears throat> where um, we um, uh, are tasked with uh, uh, bringing the priorities of the African Union and African uh, uh, member states of the UN to the global arena. Look, working with the African Union uh, very closely uh, on, on priorities of the AU, and then um, uh, uh, providing advisory services to African member states through the, the African group of states uh, at the UN um, on, different, um, on different technical areas uh, that have to, um, uh, to do with uh, the peace security development nexus where peace and security are necessary for development and there can not be development without peace and security. Um, this, is, this is how um, I've arrived here. I would just say, you know, not to, to go on for too long at this point, but um, my my advice, especially if you're if you're coming out of undergrad or you're studying uh, at the graduate level for at Rutgers, um, that uh, if you're able to to look at, you know, uh, um, to, to be open to different opportunities, that that the path may be circuitous sometimes, um, but. Uh, you know, working uh, again, like in an NGO or uh, working in the field, certainly in, a, in, a, in an African country or, or somewhere outside of the New York area. This is um, this is uh, uh, definitely a worthwhile uh, move. Um, and, you know, something that that uh, also that Pablo touched on is that, you know, do you see working at the UN, do you see direct uh, impact? Do you see results? Well, I can say as an example that, uh, that during my time in, in Johannesburg with the UN Population Fund, working in a regional office, so not really on the ground work per se, but uh, policy, policy um, uh, advice whereby my regional director, as well as uh, the global head of, of the organization, were meeting with heads of state in our East and Southern Africa region. And I could see just over the, the five or six years I was there that uh, certain, certain countries that had had a very uh, sort of uh, one way of looking at uh, population and, and uh, demographics that uh, having many babies is a, is, a, is a very positive thing for society, which it can be in certain aspects. But there was a shift uh, through UNFPA's um, advisory and, and uh, um, uh, explanation of, 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 um, of the dynamics of, of the dem demographic dividend, as we call it. But um, so you certainly, you can see uh, shifts and that's, that's a great part of the, uh, the UN system. The UN has the year of government. Um, and this is, uh, um, I think, one of the UN system's greatest attributes that it provides uh, those advisory services to government. So uh, Margo, I would like to I think stop there for now, but really thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think your, your comments are also quite insightful and we really appreciate them. I just wanna highlight um, something that really uh, stuck out for me and what you were sharing was that the route to where you wanna go is not always direct, right? So I think that's really helpful um, as we talk about these careers in global affairs that um, you can switch your career, you can do a 180 um, and, and, and come into this field. Um, it sounds like you've had um, quite a, a journey um, all the way back here to New Jersey. Welcome home. Um, and um, thank you so much for your comments. And um, um, I think they're really helpful. And we're look I'm looking forward to hearing more from you during the Q&A. Um, so now we're gonna turn to Yarina Shura here. Thank you so much, Marco, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, today as a speaker to the Rutgers Yan Alumni Group Interest Group. Uh, I am new to this group, so thank you so much for including me. 
and I'm really excited to present my short story uh, to all of you today. Um, so my name is Irina. I'm a 2019 graduate uh, from the master program at Rutgers in United Nations and Global Policy Studies. And um, probably I'm that 1.7% of young uh, people that are now um, holding a career in uh, global affairs at the United Nations. Uh, it wasn't a, an easy uh, path, but um, um, it, it's all worth it. So uh, I, I hope that today I will be able to um, make you more interested and excited about inter uh, uh, in starting this career as well from your perspective. So today I will, um, I don't have as much experience as my previous panelists uh, on the field. So I will just uh, delineate a little bit of my path um, in studies and experience, experiences that I had uh, before, um, before today and then extract from there my biggest challenges and successes. So um, I will start from where I was born. I was born in Ukraine. And um, as, as, as silly as can, it can sound, but I decided to, uh, to, start a career, to start building a career in political science from when I was seven years old, uh, because probably a lot of you uh, may know that in Ukraine, we don't have uh, an adrenaline of Wall Street or Silicon Valley. So um, administrative institutions were uh, pretty much everything that I knew, uh, everything that built up the country. And so I was really excited about doing, being part of that and doing something meaningful, um, as I thought at that time, uh, for, for Ukraine. But um, yeah, so that was something that stayed in my mind for a lot of time. And then when I was able to decide what to study at the university, that was still my first choice. Um, at the age of 10, I moved with my parents to Italy. And as, a, as you already know, I started my, my uh, professional career um, in study political science at the University of Padova in uh, specifically for public administration. Um, These years were um, really concentrated on the historical and philosophical perspective of politics, so it was more um, focused on the, what happened uh, historically in political uh, arena, how to analyze this, uh, the situations and how to do better from now on. Uh, it wasn't nothing practical and it wasn't concerning the global affairs, uh, but it was still really interesting to me. So uh, I just continue with, with that. I was really uh, excited about all the, um, all the topics that, I that we were uh, studying. But then um, being so broad, political science, probably all of you know how broad it is and how many different issues um, it has. I was really um, lost in the views about my career, my professional development. Um, but one particular moment in uh, during my bachelor degree. Um, it was an um, extracurricular event, uh, nothing to do with my uh, with my classes. I attended this event and I discovered what is sustainable development. Um, you, it may sound really interesting now because uh, pretty, pretty much everything about the UN now concerns sustainable development goals. But at that time in 2015, uh, in Italy, sustainable development wasn't discussed so much, especially in the classrooms of the university. So for me, it was a big, um, a big discovery. And that was uh, the first step that I understood what is global, uh, what is global affairs and how every single issue that we may, um, we may decide in our countries can affect others as well in other countries and international politics. So uh, that really um, entered my mind and I decided that that, that would be something that I would really like to work to work on. Um, during my uh, bachelor degree, I also had the opportunity to study abroad in Spain, uh, which opened um, quite a lot my, my perspectives as well and contributed to, to perceive this path. Uh, shortly after, I moved to New Jersey uh, in 2017, and um, I decided to attend Rutgers, uh, the master program in global affairs, um, which was completely different from what I had from my experience uh, in Italy uh, in, during my bachelor studies, because it was uh, a really exciting program that was discussing uh, contemporary issues and opportunities, challenges of countries in contemporary world, uh, especially concerning the United Nations. 
And so uh, it brought together um, a lot of students from different parts of the world and the discussions with them, uh, the, their different perspectives on the world and politics, um, together with uh, so many different curricula that the, um, uh, the program offered, it was really eyes opening how everything is interconnected. And uh, with my um, passion for sustainable development goals, that was uh, a really exciting opportunity to, um, to deepen my studies, not only in sustainable development, and I was really interested in environmental policies, uh, but also to introduce me to the humanitarian rights, um, business uh, ideas, um, and uh, gender equality, and so much on. So that was a first step that introduced me to the United Nations closely, and um, I applied for an internship um, during my, my second year of the master program. I was accepted, luckily, and uh, I uh, contributed as a um, stakeholder engagement intern for the high-level dialogue, high-level um, political forum. Uh, which is the annual review of sustainable development goals. And that uh, was really a chance for me to demonstrate how much I, uh, I'm passionate about these topics, how much I'm able to deliver on these issues, produce materials, uh, follow instructions uh, you know, from uh, coworkers. And um, it was my chance to, to show, to show myself, to show what I learned during the master's degree. And uh, that led me to get a consultancy with uh, firstly with the same office, but then um, unfortunately uh, for um, the COVID-19 pandemic, the contract were, uh, was uh, withdrew because of the funding um, deficits. But shortly after I was offered another consultancy um, that I finished one month ago uh, with the same Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And I was working again as a stakeholder engagement, but specifically for the high level dialogue on energy. Uh, that was an incredible chance to experience the global, um, the global affairs uh, and the, the negotiations between countries, NGOs, different interest groups. Uh, and as uh, Pablo and David mentioned, mentioned before, all these organizations are part of the global affairs as well. And uh, what I've seen during this, uh, this dialogue is that their voices are pretty much the, the leading voices of what is going to, to happen in the global uh, arena. And uh, what changes we are going to, to have in the particular issues. Um, so uh, if, and on the website, I, I'm, my, I ask apologies for not updating my uh, current position, but as I mentioned before, I uh, ended my previous consultancy uh, one month ago, and now I'm, uh, um, I accepted a new position, a new consultancy with um, OTA, which is the Office for Coordination on Humanitarian um, Affairs. And I specifically, my, me and my team, we are working on the, um, on the climate change crisis uh, in uh, concerning the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, needs. Uh, and um, we are organizing a global humanitarian policy forum that is going to be held in December. Uh, so it, it's, it's really exciting for me to see that even though uh, my path at the UN was um, with a lot of anxieties because of the uncertainties with the contracts. As a young professional, uh, it's really difficult to get a permanent, um, a permanent uh, contract, but it really gives you the opportunity to, um, to challenge yourself and to see a lot of different uh, perspectives from whatever you are interested in. So if it's sustainable development, there are so many perspectives of it. So you just have to accept um, these, these challenges and um, and it's a really great opportunity to to be uh, to be part of the UN uh, as a young a young professional. Um, I think more will be discussed during our quest, uh, question and answers. So uh, I would like to end here, and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. Um, your remarks were, were really on point and um, thank you for sharing your journey.
and your story. You're, you have quite the international background. Um, and I appreciated your comments about um, that this wasn't an easy path to get where you are today, um, but it's all worthwhile. And um, also that um, you, which is it's also along the same lines of, as our other presenters have shared to just be open, right? About the different opportunities. It might necessarily be exactly what um, the type of job that you want right now, but um, be open and accept um, some of these challenges um, that you're faced with. So thank you, Irina. So we're gonna, um, and thank you all for your thoughtful presentations. We're gonna move now into um, the Q&A. Um, so please add your questions to the chat area. I will read them aloud to the group. We'll take a couple at a time um, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, and thank you for your patience as we um, move forward into the, the Q&A. Um, for those of you that have questions directly related to Rutgers Global Opportunities or research that you're conducting, um, I recommend that you reach out to your advisors or visit the uh, website global.ruckers.edu that has some resources available. Um, a few of you already submitted your questions um, when you registered. Um, and so I will begin with some of those. Let me just pull them up here. Okay. Let's see. All right, so I'm going to read a few at a time, and then um, I will will go through the the panelists. And if there's a question that appears that is directed toward one of the panelists, um, we'll start there as well. So um, let's see. These are are some questions that we received early on. So have your career paths in global affairs allowed you to make the world a better place? If so, how? Um, what can a licensed clinical psychologist do? in the career of global affairs? And uh, what would give an applicant a high probability of consideration for a job in global affairs? Um, so if Pablo and Yurina, you wanna turn your screens on, that would be great. Excellent, okay, Pablo, um, is, can you speak to any of these uh, questions? Yeah, maybe I'll answer one quick on, on licensed psychologists. We do have licensed psychologists on that roster of investigators of sexual and gender-based violence that I mentioned uh, earlier that we deployed. Uh, we deploy about 30 a year. Most of them are investigators, but we have uh, uh, licensed psychologists. Obviously, we deal with a lot of trauma. Uh, I would suggest um, to the person who sent that question to look for jobs in the World Health Organization, in the UN Population Fund, and uh, to look for uh, networking opportunities in the mental health and psychosocial support task force of uh, the interagency standing committee, which is basically mental health in emergency situations. Uh, as for uh, uh, impact, uh, I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, the, uh, the last five years, I've worked a lot on the Security Council. Uh, so uh, my main job is to make sure that when the Security Council meets, that they're raising uh, women's issues and that these are incorporated into their decisions. Uh, and uh, so through a variety of ways uh, and working with the member states that are part of the Security Council, we've gone from uh, maybe only 15% of Security Council resolutions uh, mentioning issues of uh, gender equality to about 70% uh, in the last uh, few years. Uh, so that's a significant change. Does that change the world? The Security Council doesn't, you know, they, they, th these resolutions are globally binding, but they, we don't have a world government. We don't have a ways of, ways of enforcing them. They're often not written as law. Uh, you know, they're often sort of encourages, urges, calls for, um, but they do help in the sense that they, 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 they give a hook for advocacy for the organizations on the ground of all of these countries when they're advocating for certain things with their governments. They can say, look, the Security Council said this. Uh, it can help them raise funds from donors uh, 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 based on this. And it also gives more targeted instructions to the peacekeeping missions, the sanctions committees, uh, uh, et cetera, to address these issues. And another idea, I worked before the Security Council, I worked a lot with peacekeepers and I worked a lot on trying to get more women peace, women uh, uh, military and police uh, officers into peacekeeping operations. And so we did some trainings, we did a, a, a number of initiatives. 
But in uh, 2015, uh, uh, I came up with uh, 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 an idea, which I put out in a policy memo uh, uh, for, for the peacekeeping review of using financial incentives, just like uh, the uh, peacekeeping budget was exper experimenting with risk premiums. Uh, you know, the UN reimburses the countries that deploy uh, blue helmets. And so to add a financial incentive, basically the thing was, if you're not going to force them and put it as a, as a condition, how about incentivizing it financially uh, uh, through a number of ways? And I detailed how much would it cost and how would you do it? The UN did not like that idea. The, the peacekeeping uh, department uh, you know, didn't want to add this premium uh, to their peacekeeping budget, but the Canadians did. They liked that idea, they picked up the memo, and now there's a $26 million fund called the LC Initiative Fund to help deploy more women in peacekeeping operations, which I think is a good thing. Thank you, Pablo. Um, anyone else want to comment on uh, any of those questions that we received? Irina, Daniel? Sure. Yeah. Um, if I may, yeah, thanks. I, um, also, you know, that, that question about uh, making the world a better place, I, I do believe so as well. I believe um, that, uh, like Pablo mentioned, there are some very good uh, concrete um, uh, things that we see, uh, for example, when I was with the, uh, the this uh, uh, global cancer initiative that the International Atomic Energy Agency was was uh, was uh, leading at the time. Uh, at the time, um, I, the IAEA was just beginning to work with WHO and and to go to certain countries um, in Africa, Asia, Latin America to 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 begin speaking with gov the governments there about uh, providing. Uh, cancer control assistance in different areas of cancer control. And I, I remember being part of those early missions in 2006, 2007, 2005. And uh, in some cases, ministers of health in these countries said, no, no, we don't have a cancer problem. We have a, a transmissible disease, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis are affecting us the most. Uh, WHO and other experts really were able to show just a forecast of rising incidence in cancer and other um, um, other uh, um, similar diseases, um, but especially cancer, and and it really woke up, you know, it really really brought this issue to to the government's attention. Like I said, I think the UN, the the, the largest contribution is having the ear of government, being advisor, providing advisory services to government. And I think uh, I think we saw a shift already from that. So yeah, that's just something I wanted to add in. Thanks very much. Thank you, and Irina, we'll start yes. with you next time. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, yes, I just uh, I want to to make a brief comment on the um, on making the world a better place. I think this is uh, the answer to this question comes from um, can come on different times because, for example, uh, with the two consultancies that I had, they were uh, both working on climate change. For example, the first on energy, the other on humanitarian needs. Uh, although connected to climate change, right? But the first one was more the, you know, the tools to mitigate climate change and the other one is to uh, the climate, change, uh, climate change adaptation. So for example, uh, if you mitigate something, of course you will have the, the answer of uh, making the world a better place in years ahead, five, 10 years from now. Uh, of course, every single pro program that um, everyone is working on, they're hoping that the results will, will come at some point, but it's really difficult to say, to stay motivated uh, and know for sure that it's gonna be a better place. But um, if you know, we have the, the global goals in our, in our mind, of course, uh, it, will, the, the, um, it will come at some point. So thank you so much. Thank you, Irina. Um, so I'm gonna um, share a couple more questions now. Um, what networking advice do you have for people who wish to work in the State Department or at the United Nations? Um, and Irina, you, you touched upon this a little bit too. I think this question is really directed at you. Um, how do you see the inclusion of climate scientists in this space um, as a career? Um, Maybe we'll start there and then we'll we'll move over to the networking advice. How about that? Good? Yes. Um, 
So from what I've seen, uh, especially with climate change, a lot of um, opportunities are coming from the outside uh, the UN and especially with climate scientists. Um, a lot of um, cons um, um, uh, negotiations and also um, roundtables are held with uh, with the experts on the climate uh, and NGOs that are working on the field. So if you are interested more in something more scientific, uh, probably it will be best uh, to um, to get in touch with one of these organizations. Uh, from what I've seen um, from my internship to the consultancy now, and only two years have passed, is that more outside organizations and NGOs are part of the of the UN system and part of the negotiations as well because uh, everything is more uh, online as we all know so it's really easier for these organizations to come uh, and be part of the discussion uh, than traveling to for example New York or Vienna um, to express their uh, to be invited and to discuss all together. Thank you, Yarina. Um, Daniel, Pablo, do you want to share any thoughts about um, any advice for networking um, for folks that want to work at the UN or the, the State Department in those types of international spaces? Well, I don't have uh, much additional to, to add. Uh, I think Pablo had some uh, good points earlier on and, uh, and Yarina had some very good points. I think just um, keeping your eyes open for internships actually is is a is a, uh, a good way to to maybe to maybe get the conversation going with with uh, with the UN and as far as as far as uh, uh, connecting with with the UN. So definitely keep your eyes open for those. Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks, Daniel and Pablo. Anything else to add here? Well, only to, to qualify that even internships are extremely competitive. Uh, so um, we open for internships, we get 300, 400 applicants, uh, and, you know, we go through several filters interviews. So um, it's, it's, it's um, obviously globally advertised, you know, you're competing uh, with the world in a way, but you have a giant advantage, which is that you speak English and you live uh, next to the biggest headquarters. Uh, uh, so that gives you already a huge competitive advantage over everybody else, even unfair uh, uh, to, to, to some degree. Um, and related to that, you were asking about networking, um, at least in, in, on my field of uh, gender equality and women's rights, uh, the largest uh, women's rights conference uh, 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 in the world every year happens in March in New York City. Uh, so that brings, uh, in a normal year, that brings tens of thousands of people uh, to thousands of side events and, and, and meetings in New York. Uh, and many of these side events are open and easy to get to. And there you can meet a lot of these organizations, not just the UN, but a lot of the NGOs that, that work in this space. And then from September to October, there are lots of networking opportunities because you go from the General Assembly to October, which is a big month in the Security Council for, for women's rights issues and gender equality, to November, which is you know violence against women, 16 days of activism and all of that. So um, there are always things uh, in New York. So take advantage of, of, of your advantage. Thank you, Pablo. And um, just to add to that, I know that if Thematic, if there's a thematic area that you're interested in, there's often the similar types of conferences that are held um, in New York, like there's the Commission on Population Development, um, there's, there's a lot going on, and, and often there are side events that are open to the public, which are great networking opportunities as well to meet folks. I'm not sure how it is in the age of COVID, now that everything is virtual and online, but hopefully um, we will be um, coming back to those more um, in-person types of meetings. I wanted, we only have a couple minutes left um, and we've gotten a lot of questions about additional resources regarding job opportunities. I know Pablo, you mentioned um, the Relief uh, web uh, website and then um, Daniel, you mentioned NGOs um, at, 
anyone have any other suggestions of, of folks to visit or go to for these types of opportunities? And then uh, maybe if you can just share in, um, your closing remarks, because we are under three minutes now, um, what were some of the, or one of the most um, beneficial personal experiences that you've had um, to benefit your career in, in global affairs? If you can share that. That would be great. And then I have to conclude our event. So um, who would like to start? Daniel, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, thanks. Um, again, uh, yeah, well, reliefweb.net, this is certainly a, a, good, a good place to look. Um, it's, it, there, there are similar uh, websites, unjobs.org, uh, that, that lists not just UN positions, but similar uh, positions in global affairs. Um, it's definitely, definitely worth a look. Um, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, what was, what was a, a moment or something that, that helped, helped um, uh, move along the career. I think, I think for me, it was, it was some very good words of advice when I was in my first UN position under sort of a tenuous contract, but that it was someone who was um, a career person and really just gave good advice to stay with, um, stay with things if possible. And, and um, you know, and, and remember, you know, the advice that I said that uh, remember things aren't always straightforward, but, uh, you know, keep your eyes on what you really want to be doing. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, so much. Pablo or Irina, any final comments you want to share? Okay, I'll go first. Um, yes, um, I think one uh, one uh, really useful uh, website and opportunity that um, students can explore is the UN Volunteers Online. Uh, I participated on two projects with this um, um, with this opportunity, and um, it's a uh, really similar to an internship, but. Um, uh, if you don't have a lot of time. Uh, so as you, all of you know, uh, your internships are full-time uh, and require minimum three months of uh, commitment. UN volunteers uh, are really specific to one project and it goes from couple, a, couple, a couple of weeks to maybe one month. Um, so uh, it's really good to, to have it on your resume and it really introduces you to a broad, um, a broader, uh, broader teams and a lot of issues that you might be interested in. Um, yes, uh, for uh, additional resources, I think the uh, UNMA uh, website, the from a master degree that I attended at Rutgers, they have a really long list of NGOs working uh, with, um, with the UN and uh, all the UN agencies uh, with specific websites to, to their career site, to their career uh, pages. And you can visit that as well. Um, maybe I will share with organizers of the event events so you can uh, distribute it in the email. And um, yes, I think for me, the biggest, um, the biggest suggestion um, is to be open-minded and uh, learn new languages. I think that that was one of the, <laughs> the biggest advantages that I had um, working with the UN. And uh, yes, just be open-minded and um, take any opportunity you have. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Irina. You. Thank you so much. And Pablo, finally, do you have any closing <clears throat> comments? Nothing to add, and that way we can finish on time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone, so much. Uh, we hope this was an insightful and worthwhile evening for you. Um, thank you to, for the presenters for sharing their time with us and reflections tonight. Um, and thank you for the attendees for joining us. Please be on the lookout for a follow-up email um, in the next 24 hours uh, with some other additional information and evaluation and uh, future events that the DGA and Rutgers Alumni Association are organizing. Have a wonderful evening and, and thanks so much again. Bye-bye.